Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, looking at verses 18 through 29, looking at the church of Thyatira. The title of our study is Thyatira Tolerance Towards Sin. Now, this is the fourth letter um, to the church mentioned in the book of Revelation. The last one mentioned in chapter 2. There will be three in chapter 3, and we'll look at those in the next three weeks ahead. Um, but just kind of to recap, we've, we've gone through three of them already. So we're kind of at the halfway point, if you will. We looked at Ephesus, the loveless church who was going through the motions without the devotion. Right? Outwardly, everything looked great, but God said, you don't love me like you used to. And then we looked at Smyrna, who was a persecuted church. They were uh, just being a witness for the Lord. And, and the Lord said... Endure until the end. Endure until heaven. Keep going. And they did. And then last week we looked at Pergamos, uh, the, ch- the compromising church who let go of biblical doctrine. They began to kind of say, well, you know, the Bible's important, but I'm just not going to really devote myself to it. And I'm going to trust what so-and-so says. And uh, we saw that led to compromise. It was a fade uh, and a drift away from the word of God. And now we're at Thyatira, it's, it's become a corrupt church. Uh, it's a church that's abandoned the Lord and began to tolerate sin. You know, the spirit of compromise that started with Pergamos really reached its prime here in, in Thyatira. And this was an area, um, it was right next to this river, the, the Lycus River. And uh, bronze workers and fine brass workers would work there next to the river doing their trade. Um, probably making idols as well. And uh, this an area in the Roman province of Asia, and which today is modern-day Turkey. And so near the western part of modern-day Turkey, uh, inland a little bit, but right next to a river. What's interesting is the name Thyatira means sacrifice of contrition or sweet savor of labor. And this was a time of spiritual darkness. And truth was abandoned, and Christianity began to be replaced by old pagan forms of idol worship. Um, They began to think that it was by their labor and these sweet-smelling sacrifices that somehow God would be pleased, even though their hearts were far from God. Um, Their lips would say something, but their hearts said something else. And so God was looking at this church, and again, outwardly, things looked great. um, But they were in critical condition. They were like an ICU, right? They were on life support. They were spiritually sick by tolerating sin, and they replaced truth with pleasure. They were seeking after, if it feels good, do it kind of stuff. Now, again, I need to remind myself, and I think all of us, that there's no perfect church. I hate to break that to you. (laughs) There's no perfect church. And this last month, I've had three or four people um, contact me looking for a church. And some of them, they haven't been in church for five, six years. And their, their answer was, I just, I'm looking for a perfect church. And it's like, you're never going to find it. And in fact, you want to come check us out, you're going to find we're not perfect either. There's no perfect church. It's reminding me there's no perfect family as well. We all have issues in our family. Most of it we keep private. It's just between us and the Lord, which is fine. Um, but there's no perfect family. There's no perfect city, no perfect government, no perfect employer or co-workers or boss, no perfect pastor. I hate to break that to you as well. Uh, and we're not perfect either, right? Each of us, we're, we're imperfect. But we have a perfect Savior, a perfect Lord who loves us perfectly. And that's what we want to pursue. That's what we want to focus on is our Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 18, we'll look at that in just a second. Again, this is the, the introduction. Each letter, Jesus will introduce himself and give us some symbolism and imagery as he does that. And so let's take a look at that here in verse 18. So Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. We'll pause there. This, again, is a message from the Lord. 
This is not a message from John the Apostle to the church. This is a message from Jesus to His church. I mean, we've looked at the letters from the Apostle John. We've seen the Gospel of John. We've seen 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We've looked part of this book already, Revelation. But this section is a message directly from the Lord to His church. And if you have a, a certain type of Bible, you might see that this section is in red letters. That indicating these are the exact words coming from the mouth of Jesus. And we, sh- we should heed what Jesus is saying to his church. We also see that in verse 18 here, that the end of it, we get the description. Just in case we didn't know who was addressing us here. It says, these things says the Son of God. The Son of God is a reference to Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures. Uh, It's talking about how Jesus is God, but he's also the Son. And that can be confusing. And I love the way that Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 expresses it. It says it this way. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That, That they're not the same, yet they are the same. They're not the same in the persons, right? The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, but yet together they are one, they're God. Again, it's, it's, it can be complex, um, but if we try and put God in a box, then we haven't figured it out. The reality is that we can't figure God out. His ways are above our ways, His thoughts are above our thoughts. We have to believe that there's a triunity in the Godhead, there's one God, as the Scriptures clearly teach, yet He's revealed Himself in three distinct persons, or three distinct ways. And, and those three ways, those three persons, makes the completeness of the Godhead, the one God. Um, and so, that's what's going on here. Is that Jesus is God. He's the Son of God. He's God made manifest. So we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. And here we see that the Son is declaring, He is God. There are some people who claim, Jesus never claimed to be God. And I, I think they just haven't read the scriptures. Because here's another point where Jesus is saying, He's the Son of God. If God had a Son, then He would also be God. And, and Jesus is God Himself. So, we're also told here that He has feet like fine brass. And this speaks of refinement and judgment. God is telling His church, He wants the church to be refined. He wants the church to be purified. And, and that's the picture of this, this fine brass, uh, which is interesting because, again, that's one of the, the things the area was doing. Uh, these brass workers, these um, skilled metal workers, they're probably making idols. And Jesus is saying, well, I, I want to re- refine you and purify you just as that metal is purified. I want to do that to my church. I want my church to be pure and called out from the world and called towards me. And so... Jesus also tells us here, he has eyes like a flame of fire. That literally means Jesus sees everything. You can't hide anything from the ultimate source of light. When there's darkness around, the light expels the darkness. And Jesus is saying, I see everything. I can also see the insides of what's going on. I can see the thoughts. I can see your heart. I can see your motives. That nobody else can see. I know what's going on. To me, that's a reminder that I can't, I can't pretend with the Lord. i got to be transparent and honest and just genuine with the Lord. If I'm upset, I'm upset with the Lord. He's a big God. He can take it. You know, He, he can deal with my heart in that issue. If I'm, if I'm crying because I'm broken over something, that's okay. He can help me with that. But if I don't be real with Him then I'm not going to get that restoration that I need. And so we want to be real with the Lord. He wants us to be open and honest with Him. And so Jesus identifies Himself here. He tells us who He is. He, in essence, tells us He loves us. He sees everything that we're doing. And and next we're going to see He affirms the church's positive actions. And we see that next here in verse 19. He says, I know your works. Love, service, faith, and your patience, 
And as for your works, the last are more than the first. We'll pause there. Jesus is telling this church, you're doing great. You're, 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 you've got a devotion for me. We see he lists five qualities that they were doing good at. Love, faith, service, perseverance, and greater works. So this was a growing church, maybe not numerically, but it appeared that they were growing spiritually in their relationship with the Lord. Outwardly, this looked like a successful church. I mean, things were going great there. Uh, maybe they had the numbers. Maybe there were a lot of people coming, and things appeared great. But then they went into a steep decline. So what happened at Thyatira? A shift began to take place in the hearts of the people. They began, instead of responding to the love of God and living a life in response to His love and just enjoying the grace and, and the relationship with Him, they began to shift in their mind and their hearts that maybe if I do things for God, then it puts Him in the position that He owes me. It's almost like putting God in a headlock. Like, God, I tithed, I served, I've washed the apostles' feet. Now you owe me something, and here's what I want. And, and that's what began to happen, that they began to focus on works and the things that they were doing more than focusing on who they were doing it for, which is supposed to be the Lord. And if we're not careful, our hearts can do the same. We can go from working as unto the Lord, from working to try and, and, and earn favor from the Lord, trying to get God to do something for us. And so... We see that they had a good beginning, um, but they didn't have a good ending. And if you have to choose one between a good ending and a good beginning, or a good beginning and a good ending, excuse me, um, you probably want the latter, right? You want a good finish. Um, you know, if you ever watch a marathon, you see all the people that start at the starting line. It looks great, but not everyone makes it to the finish line. That's, that's the most important part is that you cross that finish line, that you finish your race and you finish it well. Don't have to be first. You just got to finish, and it's a reminder to us that we either finish strong for the Lord or we finish wrong for the Lord. And so that's what was going on here. They had made some excellent headway, but then they began to drift off course. And I think it's a warning to us as well uh, that we need to make sure that we stay close to the Lord. Hebrews two one says, "So we must listen very carefully to the truth that we have heard." Or we may drift away from it. And I just think, how true is that? That we need to make sure that we stay close to the Lord, close to His Word. You know, the very moment we begin to neglect... <coughs> excuse me. The very moment we begin to neglect our walk with the Lord, um, our prayer life our scripture reading life, our fellowship life with other people, we begin to drift away. We begin to make excuses. Well, I'm too busy, or I don't have time for the Lord today, or, well, I'll make it up, I'll go next week, or, you know, I haven't been in the Bible for a month, but, you know, it's okay, and I, and I already know pretty much what it all says, and we begin to, to slowly drift away, and it, it's subtle. But Hebrews is telling us this. Um, that if we're not careful, um, we're going we're gonna to fade from the Lord. We're going to drift away from the Lord. And I've seen this many times where people begin to drift away from Christ. They begin to drift away from other Christians, from a church family. And, and, and then before long, they've got issues going on. And you begin to go, well, what's going on? Why is your, why is your family a mess? You know, why, why, why is your life falling apart? It's because they... they didn't center it on Christ. They were, but then things kind of got wobbly and they kind of drifted away and you kind of put it on cruise control and it's great if you're on cruise control and it's a straight road, but there's some quick turns coming up. You got to take it off. Otherwise, you're going to go into the ditch. And, and that's what happened in this church. They, they thought, we're just going to keep going as we've always gone. And, and they didn't realize that they had lost that personal connection with the Lord, that that heart-to-heart -heart connection with Christ. And we want to make sure that, that we make sure that we finish strong for the Lord, that we stay close to Him. Well, next, we'll see just how serious this drifting away from the Lord is and what happens 
if we don't come back to Christ. We see that here in verses 20 through verse 23. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. We'll pause there. Again, Jesus knows our mind. He knows our hearts. Uh, As a good physician, He's the one who can give us the correct diagnosis. And what he says here to this church is he has a few things against them. What's interesting here in verse 20, um, he says that you allow that woman. Um, Another word here that's also used in in reference to that word allow is the word tolerance. And, you know, that's that's one of the buzzwords today is, is the word tolerance. Our culture will forgive just about anything except intolerance. And our, our culture has also kind of made the shift that if you have a truth and I have a truth and you don't accept my truth, then you're intolerant. Again, both can't be true, but our society says it is. And, um, you know, they want to make it out that, uh, that, they're, that what they say is more valid than what you say. It reminds me of what happened in the Garden of Eden. The devil began to cause doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve. Did God really say you're not to partake of that tree? I mean, come on, really. That's so intolerant of God. He's holding back from you. I mean, sin's not going to really kill you. You're not going to fall over dead. Come on, just try it. See what happens. I mean, it's okay. It's not... What's, what, what evil could come of it? You're going to be like God. You're going to know good and evil. You're going to be wise. Don't you want to be wise? And we see the devil lied. That, hey, it's okay to be tolerant of sin. It's okay to be just a little disobedient towards God. And today, many people have created an idol. That there's a false God in their mind. That he's okay with their sin. He's not okay with, with someone else's sin, but he's okay with my sin. I mean, it's just a little sin, and he's okay with it. And what happens, and they may not even fully realize it, is they've made a false Christ. They've made a false Jesus in their mind. A Jesus who's tolerant of sin. And again, the devil lies to us that sin is okay. But God tells us the truth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his word tells us that sin is going to destroy. It's going to wreak havoc. You look what happened to Adam and Eve. They didn't die physically. They died spiritually. They got kicked out of this perfect paradise, the Garden of Eden, and brought a curse to this fallen world that we live in today. Thanks, Adam and Eve. (laughs) You know? And so, did it it cause devastation? Yes. And this is a very subtle way. The devil will come in and attack. You know, well, God's not going to destroy you completely, which is true. Um, but God's going to bring some correction because he knows if he doesn't bring correction that the sin's going to destroy you. And so the devil's very sly in the way that he'll, he'll try and get people to, to entertain the sin. And then when God does bring correction, then he'll probably try and bring condemnation, which there's none of that in Christ. Um, but the devil doesn't like it that our sins are forgiven in Jesus. He wants to bring things back and, well, look at you, you know, how could you be a Christian? You, you used to do that. And we have to remind ourselves that, you know what? That was before Christ, or that's been forgiven in Christ. And this is a reminder of why Jesus came. He came to suffer and die on the cross for our sins. He knew that sin was what separated us from him. And he shed his life's blood on that tree for us. And he gave his life up so that we can have our sins forgiven. 
And he was in the grave and rose three days later, proving that he has the power to defeat sin and the penalty of sin, which is physical death as well. So Jesus' desire is that our sins would be forgiven. Uh, he gives us time to repent. And I'm very thankful for that. Now, the church of Thyatira had this issue, a tolerance of gross sin. In the midst of the church, and Jesus is saying, I'm intolerant of your tolerance. I'm intolerant of, of you being tolerant of sin. You're allowing sexual immorality into the ranks of my church. And I'm not going to stand for that. So how did this happen? Well, Jesus tells us here in verse 20, it appears that this false prophetess was leading people into compromise. And it's possible her name was literally Jezebel. Um, it's possible that was her real name, but more likely it's a metaphorical reference to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there was a lady named Jezebel. And uh, she was an idolatrous woman who opposed God, opposed God's ways. And the Christians um, in this local church here began to engage in sexual morality and dabble in idolatry. Which is exactly what happened in the Old Testament. Uh, the queen Jezebel, who was the wife of King Ahab um, over Israel, began to uh, lead the people astray. King Ahab should have been the, the go-to one making the decisions, and yet he kind of let his wife begin to make the decisions. And she brought uh, 450 prophets of Baal uh, in, and she began to slaughter the true prophets of God. And Elijah was one of those that was on the run. And she also taught that immorality, sexual morality, really wasn't a serious issue. That uh, the, these gods want you to have pleasure. And so the historical Jezebel ultimately um, was thrown down from a window and eaten by wild dogs in the courtyard below. And uh, she got what was coming to her. Uh, she led the people astray, and, um, and she ultimately got her just in, uh, realizing that she, she didn't have everything she really wanted. Um, she wanted power and control, and in the end, when the next king came into power, she was put in a tower, and, um, and she was deceived, and she deceived people. So perhaps here what the Lord is saying to his church is, you're guilty of tolerating sin, on the same level that Queen Jezebel brought sin into the camp of Israel and that they tolerated it. And Jesus is saying, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of what's going on in this church. Rather than rebuking this false teacher and sending her out of the church, the believers in Thyatira were allowing her to continue her deception. And Jesus pronounces judgment on this Jezebel and calls the church of Thyatira to repent of their sin. You know, the scriptures are very clear and they're strong warnings for those who believe God will tolerate sin. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. In Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, it says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, Sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. That is the works of the flesh. And right after that, it's the work of the Spirit, right? The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. There's a contrast there. If we're living after the flesh, we're going to see the destruction of that. We're going to see how sin begins to infect our lives. So the scripture is clear. You play with fire, you're going to get burned. You play with snakes, you're going to get bit. You play with sin, you keep tolerating it, it's going to sting you. It's going to bite you back. And so God wants us to bring it to Him and confess it to Him. He wants us to give our sins to Him. And Jesus is, is saying that those um, 
who don't repent, they're going to be cast into the sickbed. And um, they're going to be going into this great tribulation. Uh, verse 22 and 23 seem to be saying that the unrepentant church of Thyatira and, and carnal Christians are going to go through the tribulation because of their spiritual fornication. In other words, they want Jesus as their Savior. They don't want to go to hell, but they don't want Jesus as their Lord. They don't want Him to boss them around and tell them what to do. Uh, I don't want to go to hell, Lord, but I want to live my life the way I want to live it. And you begin to wonder, are they really saved? Are they really, are they really living for Christ at all? And so, it's, it's a reminder to us, if you continue to live this way, you're going to be left with the rapture. And this fits with other verses of Scripture that warn us to be watching and ready as we await the Lord's return. It's a stern warning. I think none of us should miss it. That if you live an immoral lifestyle without repenting, you will not make it to heaven. If you're saying, I know there's a God and I want Him to save me, but I'm going to do things my way, right? I'm going to live my life the way I want to live. I'm going to call myself a Christian, but I'm not going to live like Christ. I'm not going to pursue Christ. You've got to be careful because you're heading the wrong direction. There, as Jesus said, there's going to be many on that day saying, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew. We never had that relationship. right? You said we were like family, but we never talked. We never spent time together. He never even came over to my house. You know, That kind of thing that was going on. And so, it's, just, it's a warning for us. And um, you know, there's no exceptions to this. And I've had people come and tell me, um, hey, you know, so and so, we're living together, um, we're not married, um, we're sleeping together, but you know what? God's okay with it. Um, you know, we, we've talked to God, and, and He says we're kind of the exception to the rule. Um, and, and because God's a God of love, He wants us to be in love. You know, we're saving money by living together, we're kind of just trying out to make sure this is going to work, and, and God's okay with it. You know, and the, and the other church down the street said they're okay with it too, so. So God's okay with it. And I can tell them, and, and what I say to them is, well, how do you know that God's okay with it? And they usually reply, well, He just spoke to our hearts. And I'll say, well, no, He didn't. Well, how do you know that? I said, well, because of the Scriptures. I said, you need to memorize 1 Thessalonians 4.3. It says, God's will for you is to be holy, to be pure, to stay away from sexual sin. God's will is not for you to engage in sexual sin. It's very clear. God does not contradict His word. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 makes it very clear. He's called us to be pure. He's called us to be uh, sexually pure. And, uh, well, that's your interpretation, Pastor. Well, I'm pretty sure Scripture makes it clear in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. This is God's will for your life. Your sexual purity. You know, there's no exceptions. God does not contradict Himself. And, and we need to make sure that we, we know that. Uh, we know the Word of God. Now, sexual temptation was an issue in this church and in that time and that day and age. And I, it's ever more present today in our modern society. Um, there's idols of money, pleasure, fame, the good life. They compete to take the place of the one true God in the hearts of people today. And even today, we sometimes honor possessions or success or physical pleasure or even religious perfection instead of simply trying to honor God and trying to please Him to find out what, what would do best for the Lord. What's also fascinating is if you study the Scriptures, you'll see that idolatry and sexual immorality are always linked together in the Bible. And I think there's a real reason there because the moment you begin to justify your sin then you've created a false god in your mind. Well, my God's okay with this. My God says that this is not wrong. My God made me this way. It's okay. Well, just to hear or there a little, God, my God's okay with it. Well, what you've done is you've created a false god, a god in your mind, not the god of the scriptures. Um, and that's what was going on in this church. They begin to say, well, well, God forgives, right? Yes, he does forgive it, but that's not a license to sin. Right? We shouldn't continue sinning, uh, in essence, as Paul said, re-crucifying Christ again and again. We should try and say, Lord, forgive me. 
cleanse me. That's God's desire for us. And so the worship of pleasure is, is prevalent in our society. The whole, if it feels good, do it mentality uh, is still alive today. And sexual drama pervades our culture. You've probably heard it well before that sex sells. Um, you see it sell clothes, cosmetics, boats, books, cars, movies, music. If you can get something sexy on there, it's going to sell. If it's just plain and, and just says new and improved, no one's going to want to buy it, right? And so we see that sexual expression is a highly coveted and highly contested freedom in our culture today. In our permissive society, God's good purposes for sex within the boundaries of marriage are distorted. They're misunderstood in so many countless ways. And we see a perversion of what God intended within the bounds of marriage today. And that includes pornography and, and even adultery. And what's sad is we even see some churches have gotten into scandals with cover-ups, with issues with minors and issues with uh, the opposite sex. And they begin to cover up past events involving sexual morality instead of bringing it to the Lord in confession. And that's what God's desire for His church is, uh, is that we bring it to Him. So what are we to do in light of all this? Well, Jesus tells us here in verses 24 through 29. He says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works till the, till the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels, as I also received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In this last section, we see Jesus encourages those who remain faithful unto him. Those who have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Which is really just the same old lie repackaged. Did God really say? Did God really say sin is that bad? I mean, come on, sin is pleasurable. And the Bible even says that sin has pleasure. But then it goes on to say, for a season. And it's a short season. The consequences afterward are a longer season, right? I'm sure if you're in a car and you're doing 200 miles an hour down the road, it's kind of fun until you get a ticket and you go to jail. Then it's not so much fun, right? So sin has pleasure, but it's for a very short season. And, and we want to make sure that we enjoy the pleasure God has for us within the limitations he has for us, the boundaries he set for us. And, uh, you know, we can have good, clean fun as Christians. And so we want to make sure that we avoid sexual sin, avoid false teaching. And we're told we do that by holding fast to what we have, holding fast to the doctrine, the scriptures that God has given to us, holding fast to Jesus Christ himself, holding fast to the Bible and holding fast to the Lord. And we're told that only the faithful believer who does not fall and to Satan's trap, who is faithful until Christ's return, will be an overcomer. And, and that's my heart's desire for myself and for all of us, that we would be these overcomers. We would not be deceived. Again, outwardly, the church looked great, right? Look at them. They're, they're reaching out to the society. Look how tolerant they are. They're loving on these people who are marginalized in the community. But then they're endorsing. They're, they're allowing this sin to be okay, Again, why did Christ come if he was okay with sin, if sin doesn't destroy? He came because sin does destroy. He calls his people to repent. Again, this is why Jesus came. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose from the dead. He, he desires for us to bring our sins to him, to lay them down at his altar and say, God, I need your help. I can't do this. Take, take my sins from me. And God's willing. He wants us to do that, to come to Him and bring our sins to Him. 
So perhaps what happened in the Old Testament with Jezebel, uh, kind of wearing the pants, so to speak, in the family, and exercising the spiritual authority instead of King Ahab, is what's going on here in the church of Thyatira. That this woman became kind of the spokesman, if you will, and, and began to spread these false doctrines, um, the false teaching. You know, what's fascinating is that Christianity set women free um, to the status of equality of men, which was very rare in that day and age. Even, even the Roman rule had women oppressed. They were slaves. They were property. Um, even the Jewish culture, uh, a woman's testimony did not, was not held in the court of law. Uh, a Gentile's word was, uh, a, a Gentile man's word was more valuable in the court of law than a, a Jewish woman. Uh, but Christ came and he abolished that. He set them free. And perhaps there was some liberty that was taken uh, to the extreme here in this church uh, as this woman was leading people astray. It's a reminder of us that we need to trust God's order for his church, for his family, even when fashions and opinions of our time lead us in the opposite direction. <coughs> so, in closing, the church in Thyatira represents the church of the Middle Ages. We've seen that each one of these churches is a local church. We've seen there's spiritual application for us today. But we've also seen that there's a period of time in the church history, in the church age, that is represented in each one of these seven. And this is the time of, of the Middle Ages. Um, and if you've studied some history, you know that that was also called the Dark Ages. It was a time of of darkness, that people did not have the scriptures accessible to them. And this was from A.D. 600 to 1517, which is right after Constantine uh, declared Christian, uh, cr Christians to be set free and that Christianity be the kind of official um, Roman uh, integrated religion, if you will. But this is right before the reformer Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation. So this is a, quite a bit of time um, where the church was tolerating false doctrine and persecuting those who were faithful to the scriptures, which is just really bizarre. If you think about it, the church was persecuting and killing people who held fast to the word of God. They call them heretics. Well, that's your interpretation. You're saying that we're saved by our faith alone and not by works we're going to burn you at the stake. You're saying that anyone can understand God's word and read for themselves and pray to God and not, they don't have to go through the saints or go through us. You're a heretic. We're going to burn you at the stake. It's crazy to think about, but that's exactly what was going on. Uh, and again, it was because they drifted from the word of God. But as always, God gives opportunity for repentance. Uh, he's given opportunity here for this church in Thyatira to repent. Uh, repents of their deeds. He's given his local church that opportunity as well. He's given individual people that opportunity. And, and God is gracious. He, he, he's not willing any perish, but that all come to repentance. And as always, God gives opportunity for that. So about for 1,260 years, the Roman Catholic Church was given opportunity after opportunity to repent of their unfaithfulness to God, and they even rejected the message of the Reformation, which was to come back to the love of God and the love of the truth and the Scriptures, found in the very Word of God. And again, God's not willing to perish, but that all come to repentance. And God's will is that we bring our sins to Him. Right, First John 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's will for us is that we bring our sins to Him. We confess our sins to Him. Allow Him to forgive us and cleanse us. Not to try and sweep it under the rug and say, well, God didn't see that. It's not that bad. No, He wants us to bring it out in the light and allow Him to deal with it. And again, there's no perfect church. There's no perfect nation. Um, there's issues. In fact, some people have tried to discredit the Bible with that. You know, you look at King David, a man after God's own heart. And yet you see him fall and commit sexual immorality. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murder with Uriah the Hittite to try and cover it up. Yet he was truly repentant. 
right? Nathan the prophet gave this illustration about the story about this man who stole the sheep, and 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 then after this, you know, David said that guy deserves death, and Nathan says you're the man, and he begins to realize, wait, you're talking about me, and, and David was broken. He truly repented. He was truly remorseful and sorry over his sin. And, and there was fruit worthy of that repentance. You see in his life that he, he didn't do that again. He made sure that he's, he focused on the Lord. Uh, and it's a reminder to us that God is a God of forgiveness, a God of restoration. When we're truly repentant, he's truly wanting to do restoration. And there's nothing impossible for God. God wants to do that restoration we saw this when we studied through First and Second Corinthians. Again, there's no perfect church. We saw in First Corinthians, Paul wrote to them that there was sexual immorality in the church. There was a son with inappropriate relationships with his mother-in-law. And, and Paul said, kick him out of the church. This is gross. Get him out of there. He needs to, he needs to repent. Now, today, church discipline is a little different. Right, if somebody's sinning, you say, "Kick them out of the church." You know, we don't want them here. They need to repent before they're allowed to come back. Today, you just go down the street and you go to another church, right? Um, but at that point, that was your family. That was your lifeline. I mean, that's like that's the end. That's like, what do I do now? I don't. I don't have a family anymore. And so that was serious. And we see when we get to Second Corinthians, Paul says he's remorsed. He's repentful. He's he's come back to Christ. Welcome him back. Love him again as a brother, right? This is, this is God's desires. There's restoration now, right? That he's, God is a God of forgiveness, of grace. And we see God wants to do the same here in this church. He wants to bring his grace. He wants to bring his forgiveness to this church. It's a reminder to me that God is constantly patient with people. And I think that's something that I'm continuing to learn is to be patient with people as well. I've learned this, and I'm still learning this as a parent as well. Um, patience. <laughs> it, it's, it's difficult, um, you know, but it's something that God is patient with us. He's patient with his people. You look at his people, Israel, time and time again through the Old Testament, and you think, oh, didn't, can't, can't they get this by now? I mean, come on, 40 years in the wilderness, and then these cycles with judges, and idolatry again. And, and God's saying, I'm patient. I'm patient with people. I want them to come back to me. And God's patient with us as well. And God's always providing opportunities for, for his people to turn back to him. I love what he, what he says um, in Second Chronicles. In Second Chronicles 7.14, he says it this way. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. That's 2 Chronicles 7.14. And that was God's declaration to Solomon, right? As the temple's completed being built, and saying, If my people, after this temple is being built, are led astray, if they say, God, forgive us, I'm going to hear, I'm going to restore, and I'm going to heal their land. And, and that's God's desire. Now, during the time of, of, of Jezebel, God raised up a man named Elijah uh, to defeat the prophets of Baal and, and to bring reform and truth back to the people of God, that there is a one true God who's to be worshipped, to be reverenced. And, and Martin Luther was also a man during a dark time in church history who God raised up to bring truth back to the church. Um, and he brought back two central beliefs. The Bible is the central and final religious authority, and that humans may reach salvation by faith and not by works. I wonder perhaps if God is looking for a few good men and women today who will bring back reform and truth to His church today. Bring back the importance of the Word of God, of knowing the Word of God, knowing the doctrine, knowing the Scriptures, knowing who God is, having that personal relationship with Him. Again, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship with God. And that's God's desire, that God wants to transform His church once again, that we would not have a tolerance towards sin, we'd have a closeness with Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. 
We thank you for giving us your scriptures, for giving us your truth. Thank you for these letters to the seven churches. Jesus, we thank you for the redemption and the forgiveness of sins we have in you. Thank you that you've come to set us free from the bondage of sin. Thank you for telling us the truth that sin destroys. But the, you want to forgive. You want to restore. You've got grace for us. And we just ask by your Spirit that you'd empower us to stay close to you. We stay watching and ready for your return. That we would have a heart to want to please you more than we want to please ourselves. That we have a heart that wants to be fully devoted to you, to fully surrender to you. God, we're reminded that there's no perfect church, no perfect family or pastor or there's, there's just, we live in an imperfect world. Even ourselves, we're imperfect. But you are perfect. And your word is perfect. And we ask that you'd help us to understand this truth. And to walk in your truth. By the power of your spirit, would you enable us and help us to stay close to you. And God, we pray if there's any who are here this morning or are listening to this message later online who need to surrender their lives to you, need to get things right with you, that you'd bring that to them, Lord. That you'd help them to realize that they need to repent of their sins. They need to confess that they're a sinner and confess that they need you to save them and be the Lord of their life. And if that's you this morning, say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision to trust in Jesus Christ, where you repent of your sin and you put your faith and trust in Jesus. And if you're ready to do that, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I recognize that my sin separates me from you. And I realize that this is why you came, Jesus. To suffer and die on the cross for my sins. That you shed your life's blood on the tree for me. That you were buried and rose from the grave on the third day. So God, I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sins. That you'd come into my heart and my life today. That you would change and transform me to become more like you. Wash me clean of my sins. Make them whiter than snow. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for saving me. And I ask from this day forward, you'd fill me afresh with your spirit. Empower me to live my life surrendered to you. To follow you. To live a life that pleases you. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.